This video will cover the um, <clears throat> part of the lecture that we missed from Snell. Uh, this will be the first one to start talking about mapping using tidyverse type functions, and then there will be a second video as well on mapping. So I'm going to teach mapping using something called SF, which stands for Simple Features. It's an R framework, and I, I think it's really incredible because it lets you use a lot of what you've learned with tidyverse, uh, with dplyr, and, and with ggplot into mapping. So it's really fantastic as a bridge between uh, mapping and R and what you've already learned for, for creating plots of other types of data and working with other types of data. This is a framework that's in active development. Um, I think that it, it is becoming kind of more, more and more um, uh, stable over time, but it is certainly an area where they're continuing to do a lot of stuff pretty rapidly. So I think uh, at this point, most of what I'll teach today should be should be pretty stable, but it is something to keep an eye on that, that it might be changing since this is such a new thing for R. So to load it, you'll need to install SF and then run library SF. So for an example, I'm for a first example, I'm going to pull in Colorado County boundaries for the US Census. And I'm using a package for this that I think is really fantastic. It's called the Tigris package. This actually directly accesses um, an API, an open data API that the US Census has. And it lets you pull in geographic data for the US for a number of different geographies, for things like counties and states and tracts. Um, and it lets you do that query without ever having to kind of go to the website yourself and download and then figure out how to bring it in, in R. With one line of code, you can pull in exactly what you want from that. Um, I recommend that if you're doing a lot of mapping, you look at this, this um, article about this. So I've got that pulled up here. If you go here, this is an article that was published in the R Journal. Um, and if you click on this title for it, it will take you to a PDF. So this PDF walks you through how they created this and then also a lot on how to use it. And I think one of the pieces that's particularly interesting is their first table it goes through all of the different functions that you have to pull in different types of geographies. So it's got some of these general area functions that include um, things like counties, which we'll work with today, but also states and regions, the nation, um, census tracts. Uh, and so on. It's also got legislative districts, um, some different um, functions for describing water and plotting water, different things with roads, uh, native areas, and then also some different landmarks and, and military areas. All right, so we're going to be using the counties. We'll pull in county boundaries and then we'll map this. So you need to load Tigris. And then this counties function can be used to pull in the counties. So I only want to get counties for Colorado, so you can specify which state that you want. And this can be a vector with a few states if you wanted to pull in from multiple states. The CB equals true. I don't need the finest resolution for, for this data. So I'm saying um, that I want a slightly less fine resolution. That will take up less size. And then the last piece, and this one's pretty important for the way we'll be mapping this, is you need to specify what class you want to get the object in. Um, I believe the default is to bring it in as what's called an SP type object, which is uh, from the precursor to SF, a different system for mapping in R. So in this case, you want to bring this in as an SF. Once you do that, you can look at the class of this object, and you'll see that underneath it is a type of data frame, but it's this special type, this SF type. So this is very similar to how um, a tibble is kind of a special type of a data frame. So there's just a few more elements on top of what we classically think of for a data frame. So here's what it looks like if we do a slice of the first three rows. Uh, let's start down here. So this is the part that hopefully looks a little bit more normal to you. You can see that we've got different columns. Um, so this is a state code, the state FIP code, and this is the county FIP code. Um, and uh, there's the name right here of the county. This is the land area and the water area in the county. So all of that should look pretty normal from, from working with tibbles and other types of data frames. There are a few special pieces of this, though, that are allowed to fit in because it's this SF object. One of them is this special column. So we've looked at special columns before when we looked at list columns when you nest your, your um, 
table. This is a type called a geometry column, and we'll look at that a little bit more in, in a minute, but for right now, the main point to remember is that this is just a special type of column that lets us pack a little bit more information in a format that, that's a little bit more complex than the vector we usually have for, for columns. And then the other piece is there's some information up here. And I know you see with your tibbles, sometimes you'll see some extra information there about the dimensions of your data frame and whether it has grouping applied or not. This is the same kind of idea, and in a little bit I'll walk through the different pieces that are being shown with this. All right, so let's look at that geometry column. If we do the class of it, you can see that it has the special SFC class. And in this case, it's a multi-polygon. So there are different geometric shapes. You can have a point if you're um, if you just have the latitude and longitude, for example, uh, uh, of different events, uh, that can be shown with a point. You can have a line if you're trying to show like roads or rivers or something like that that has some distance to it. Uh, you can have polygons, which are shapes. In the case of these counties, we need a multi-polygon because one county could need to have several polygons to describe it. For example, um, Dare County, which is the Outer Banks of North Carolina, is a string includes a string of islands. And so in that case, you need several polygons to correctly represent it. So for the stuff up at the top, there's several things that are, that are indicated there. One is the geometry type. And so that's kind of what we just discussed with points, polygons, lines, or, or some of the main ones for that. Um, there's also some information about the dimension. Usually this will be two-dimensional, but in some cases there will be three or four dimensions. Um, that could include something like the time for each measurement or some measure of uncertainty. Uh, the bounding box is also indicated, so that gives the X and Y range. So if you're looking at latitudes and longitudes, the maximum and minimum latitude and longitude for all of the points that are covered by that data set. And then we've got some stuff for the coordinate reference system and the projection. Um, so the EPSG is giving a code for the coordinate reference system, and then the projection has some information about how the data is currently projected. That includes the projection, which is indicated with a plus proj, and the datum, which is indicated with plus datum. So we'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. Okay, so there are some functions that come with the SF package that allow you to pull out pieces from this special type of data frame. Uh, for example, the STB box will let you pull out from the geometry the, the bounding box for a collection of points. So if we do it for the whole data set, for the whole column of geometry, this is gonna pull out the ranges uh, for all the counties in Colorado. But we can also do it on a subset. So example, if we just wanted to pull out the full first county, you can use square bracket indexing and then pull that out. And you can see that this range is tighter than the range for all of the counties. All right, so here's where the magic for this comes in. So um, you can plot this using ggplot now. There's a special geom that's specifically for this type of object. So all you have to do to create this map that shows counties in Colorado is uh, load ggplot, and then you create a ggplot object, and you add a geom sf with the data from your, um, your sf type tibble or data frame. So in this case, as we move into this, I did want to make a note. A lot of times we put our data right up in the ggplot. A lot of times as you're mapping, you will want to add these geoms, these SF geoms from different data sets to add layers to your map. And so I think in this case, it's a little safer to get in the habit of specifying your data directly in the geom. All right, so now we can do all of our normal tricks. So if you remember, there was a land area column in um, the, the object that we pulled with county information. And so if we want to show that the land area by color, we can do fill equals land area. For these polygons, as a note, because they have an inside and then they have a border, if I had specified color equals alien, then it would actually be the color of the outside part that changed. So usually when you're working with polygons in, in spatial mapping, it'll be the fill aesthetic that you want to change rather than color. 
All right, and because, again, this is all working in the ggplot framework, anything you want to do to customize, you can use your same tricks. So if we look at this one, we have the land area, and this isn't very pretty to read. Uh, this title isn't something that's going to be clear to most viewers, and maybe we don't like this color scale. So we can change all that pretty easily. Um, these are the lines that we had before where we created the initial map. But then to change the scale, to use the Veritas scale, I can just use that scale fill Veritas and then change the name with name equals land area and then change these commas and the labels with that label equals comma. And for this, you would need to have the scales package loaded. And then we can use theme dark to make the background of this darker and we can add a title with GG title. So these are all the typical tricks that you've learned for using with ggplot. And now they can be applied with spatial data because we have this SFGM that we can just add into the normal process. All right, you can also do a lot of dplyr tricks with this, um, with the original data frame, which also was very, very convenient with uh, some of the previous methods of working with spatial data in R, you kind of had to learn a whole different system of object types that um, had similarities with the rest of what you did with R, but but it did it was a bit more of a barrier. Uh, this goes right in line with the things you've been learning with the tidyverse, which I think is, is fantastic. It makes it really easy to make the shift into geospatial data. So as an example, let's say you only wanted to pull out Larimer County in Colorado. So you can take the Colorado County's data set and pipe through and run a filter and just filter to the county where the name is equal to Larimer. And now when we print it out, you'll see we have just one row that has Larimer. So now we can use this new data frame along with our other one to do something like this where we are indicating Larimer specifically and we have it labeled. So in this case, I have a geome that has the Colorado counties and the color for this in this case is light gray. Again, the color is the border. I haven't changed the default for the fill for this, just made the, the border a little bit lighter so that this pops out a little bit more. Now I can add a new layer that's got the data for Larimer. So it's just the geographical data for that one county since we filtered down to that and then set that to have a different fill than the others. And then I can add on the text for that. Uh, again, so I'm using the Larimer data. And just like if you if you want to label a point in a scatter plot, you can use this label um, ge uh, aesthetic. I'm setting the label to equal the column name. If we go back and look at that data, the name is Larimer, so that will put what we want there. And then this is just changing the color of the text. And then in this case, I've taken out the X and the Y scale since I think it's pretty evident. Uh, for somebody looking at this, that these are latitude and longitude. All right, so all of this means that you should now be able to take the data that we were working from with the NOAA Storm Events database, where we had things listed by county, and you should be able to go and uh, subset it to just the counties that are in Colorado and create a map where you show the number of events listed in Colorado in 2017 or whatever year you pick to try out for that. Um, and you can see, I think it's interesting here that, that we see maybe some clear evidence that uh, more reports are, are submitted in areas where we have more people. So some of the places where things are really popping out are the counties that include, uh, some of the front range counties, so the ones that include Denver and Fort Collins and some of the other large cities in this area. So I suggest that you take a break now and, and start on the in-class exercise and, and Right before you do, I've got um, one other challenge. If you find it pretty easy to do that first map, I suggest you also try doing the second map. So in this case, um, it, the data has been filtered down just to the events in hail, heavy rain, and tornadoes. The events that had no listings are left as, as missing as NA so that they show up as this gray. And then I, um, this plot is using faceting to show the maps for those separate types of events. So this is the added challenge if you find the other one pretty straightforward to do. And all of these, again, are using the ggplot um, uh, tricks that you've learned before for working with other types of data. So I suggest you pause the video now and do that. And then you can come back and I have the code for doing this in this, uh, these slides and I'll walk through that a little bit, but do try it before you come back and watch that. 
All right, so hopefully you've gotten the chance to try that out. Um, so let me walk through an example of the code that I used to do this. So the first code is for the first map. So this map where we're showing the number of events in 2017, including all types of events. So we started with that example, the storms 2017. And then the first step is to filter so that the state is in Colorado. Uh, then you need to get a count by each county. So if you remember, uh, this, these FIPS codes are unique by county. That's a unique identifier. So we can group by that and then run count and ungroup. This might work okay if you if you don't ungroup, but I think it's, it's probably safer in this case to ungroup the data. So at this point, if you look at your data, you should have one row for each FIPS. And then you should have um, a column with FIPS that gives the identifier. And then you should have a column with N that gives the number of events that were reported in that county in 2017. All right, for the next step, I need to merge in this data with the data that, that's geospatial. Um, when you do joins with those special SF objects, I think it's usually safer to have that as the first element of the join so that the geospatial element of it does not get chopped off. I think sometimes if you join um, a regular tibble to an SF, type tibble, then, then it will chop off some of the geospatial information, whereas if you do it with the geospatial tibble joined to a regular tibble, then you don't lose that. So that's the order we're doing here. So I'm starting with the Colorado counties. This, again, is that special SF type of data frame. Um, I need to get the five-digit BIPS code so I can join the two together. And uh, the Colorado counties data, if we go back to that, well, I can do this example. This is a subset, but it's got what we need. So you can see we have all the FIPS information here, but it's separated between the state FP and the county FP. So we need to join those two together to get a five-digit FIPS to join with our storms data. So I'm using paste to do that, but you could also use the unite function from tidyr. Or there are a number of other things that you could use paste zero, and then you wouldn't have to put stuff here. But in any case, uh, we need to put those two together. And now we have a FIPS that we can use. So now I'll do a full join. And I'll join by FIPS. Um, so this full join will ensure that if I have any FIPS that show up in one data set but not the other, it'll still make it into the final data set. This last step, there are some counties where there were no reported events, I believe, or there might be. And so I want to make sure any of those that get, li get listed with a zero count rather than staying as NA. So for N, I'm using this special if else function. So if else takes first a logical statement, and it will check that. And if that's true, then it'll do the first thing. And if it's false, it'll do the second thing. So in this case, I'm looking through, and it's saying, if the value in the N column, that's the count of events, if that is not an A, remember that this negates, then leave it as the value n, but otherwise set it equal to zero. All right, so now I have the data set where I have the Colorado counties, but at this point I've joined in the number of events, that n column, the number of events in 2019. So now you can plot it with ggplot and then use the gmsf. And in this case, the fill is equal to n. And then I can use scale fill veritas to customize the scale and uh, specify the name as well. Inside this call, I wanted to have this across two lines. You see there's the number of events, and then 2017 is on a separate line so that this doesn't get too long. You can do that in your uh, scale titles by including uh, backslash n. This stands for a new line, so that'll create a new line when it gets to that point. All right, here's the code for the kind of challenge plot. So this is the plot to remind you where it goes through, and it's got facets, separate panels for hail, heavy rain, and tornadoes. So I'm starting with the same data set, filtering to Colorado again. But then I have an extra filter line where I'm filtering so that the event type is only those that are tornadoes, heavy rain, or hail. Then for my counting, I grouped by FIPS and event type. So I'll end up with a column for FIPS, a column for event type. So each FIPS will be repeated three times for each of the three types of events. And then the end column that gives the number of, of events for that type of event for that FIPS. 
All right. So down here, I'm doing the same thing I did before, where I am um, merging this in with a join into the Colorado counties, and I have to create that five-digit FIPS code before I can do it, but then I can do the right join to get that in. Um, and in this case, I just did a right join because I'm okay with counties where there's there's nothing being left as missing because that'll show up as these gray spots in this particular graph. All right, so now I'm adding in. Um, I'm starting out by using the Colorado County status set, the original one, to get the outlines for everything. And I'm using a lighter gray for the color. So this is ensuring that we still get the outlines for these counties where nothing happened. Then I'm adding a new layer that does the county events, and here the fill is equal to N. So that's showing if there was at least one event. Um, it, it's showing how many based on the color. The scale fill viridis again to, um, to give an indication of, sorry, to, to change the color scale. This is putting the legend position on the top. So right here, the default for this would be to put it on the side, but because these are kind of spread out, I don't want to squish them by putting it on the side, so I can move that to put at the top. If I put legend position equals bottom, it would have put it down here. Then I'm using facet wrap. So this is just like a regular ggplot uh, code. We can uh, facet by one of the columns that we have, and so in this case, I'm faceting by event type. The n column equals three is forcing it all to be in one row with three columns. I could have done n row equals three here as well. And then finally, um, I've set some of the, the theme values to be uh, blank, to just not show up at all, to keep it from having too much extra text on it, to keep things pretty simple, since it's already a little bit complex with those three different panels. All right, so this video will end here, and there will be one more video covering mapping using a uh, SF.